Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope the week's gone well. Um, let me start with some macro thoughts. The Fed, with three rate cuts, quantitative easing and repo, has now brought about the loosest financial conditions in the entire cycle and the loosest financial conditions in 27 years, so says Northman Trader. And this is to my point that the liquidity bomb keeps, in my opinion, the dollar trending to the downside and therefore one should be selling rallies. Repo support has three parts, overnight repo in blue, term repo in orange, and T-bills bought red, that's from Bianco Research, um, and he concludes uh, the peak in support is probably to come, and I think that's correct as well. George Soros says at WEF, Trump is a con man, says Trump is the ultimate narcissist who puts national interests behind his own interests. That's by a Holger. Um, and of course, George, George Soros wrote that book, Staying Ahead of the Curve, which was a remarkable book in point of fact. The 10-year US Treasury yield is down 20 basis points in the last month or so, that's J.S. Blockland. T commodity likes being long the yen, which is currently at 109.62. Uh, um, and on Jan 21st, he says, buy gold and yen on virus outbreak, which coincides with the Chinese Lunar New Year holidays, where millions travel to visit family and concerns are mounting, the disease will spread, and I'll come to that uh, momentarily. But let me take a little detour through, through my home thoughts. This is a picture of Lacone Ferry in 1953. The ferry started operating in 1937. And when I was young, this is the ferry we take to go to the beach on the south coast, and really was always such a great pleasure. This is a photograph of Samburu. This photo is taken by Benjamin James Brown via Kenya Pix. Um, and the Samburu is an extraordinary place to visit. You can see from his photograph, you've got the Iwaso Nero River running through there and all the animals congregate at the river. This was a photograph of flowers on the way to Saruni camp, which is in the Samburu, some way away from that river. Uh, this is a photograph of three Samburu sunsets we experienced in the space of, I, I, you know, about 20 minutes. Um, and I just kept taking the photographs and you can see how the colors changed in that sequence. It was really very, very beautiful. Parveen Kaswan tweeted a family of elephants walking in the river full of flowers. Do you see? He really is a, a wonderful fellow to follow, a conservationist in India. At around six and Lions King's Beyonce was passing by in the middle of Samburu. That's from Malik's. Staying with the theme of animals when a Siberian tiger family made their house just in front of a camera trap, the best family affairs a camera could capture. Sky News via Perveen again. Then I saw this photograph from Tom Peters, Golden Bay, New Zealand, a few days ago, top of South Island, the sky reflecting uh, Australia's inferno. That took me back to Revelation 6, 12 to 13. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit. 
sticking with that, Luke 21, 11, there will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Chi Girl, 23 days into 2020, locust invasion, volcanic eruption, devastating fires, unusual earthquake activity, viral pandemic, NERP. And as I wrote at the end of last year, it certainly feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything it seemed was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. <clears throat> 13th of January, I wrote, 2020 opens with a bang. Now let's turn to the Wuhan coronavirus. About an hour ago, um, I saw a tweet, 833 people have been confirmed infected, 35 have been cured, 26 have died. Estimates are that this number might be undercounted quite substantially. My cousin in Shanghai sent me this video, apparently this happened today. A traveller with high fever from Wuhan went straight into a quarantine cage. That took me to Paul Virilio's City of Panic, which is a masterpiece. The city reconstructed through the use of mediatized panic. Um, and uh, this is what we're seeing with every natural disaster, health scare, and malicious rumour, now comes the inevitable information bomb. Live feeds take over real space and technology connects life to the immediacy of terror, the ultimate expression of speed. When we were struck with Ebola in Africa, admittedly in West Africa, um, and I looked at that in 2014 and I said it's about its escape velocity. Viruses exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics. Therefore, numbers can explode to the upside. It is a numbers game. The more cases you have, the more likely there are going to be mutations that could change the virus in a significant way. That was David Sanders, a professor of biological sciences at Purdue University, who was studying Ebola. But, you know, Ebola is a, is a very similar um, type of uh, uh, pandemic. The more it persists, the more likely we are going to be thrown a curve. 23rd of December, I was talking about how the world is more complex, non-linear, interdependent, where feedback loops can start spinning at dizzying speeds, and that's what the coronavirus seems to be doing at this moment. On super spreaders, an expert says, so far there is no proof this has occurred. WHO said in a statement after its briefing that amplification, presumably a super spreader event in which an infected person passes on the disease to many others, occurred at one health facility. I take you back to that link about Bill Gates kept telling us a pandemic was coming in October 2019. He ran a simulation of a coronavirus pandemic. Just three months later, the real coronavirus pandemic begins. And then, do you remember that story about the Chinese demanding the removal of uh, uh, um, computers? that were not made in China. I think, therefore, he had some insights into what was happening. It's becoming easier and easier for individual people or small groups to create weaponized diseases that could spread like wildfire around the globe, he said. Then I came across something else on Facebook. The only explanation left is artificial DNA modification possibly by the Wuhan Institute of Virology, which since 2007 has collected samples from thousands of bats 
across the country and done genetic experiments with them. The Wuhan pneumonia virus is like the bat as SARS-like coronavirus. Head of Fauna, Kuduru Farm and Botanic Garden, Dr. Gary Aids, an expert in bat ecology, is adamant that the possibility of bats transmitting their coronavirus to humans is close to zero. But Wuhan's novel coronavirus is capable of transmission between humans. Envelope protein of Wuhan seafood market pneumonia virus and that of the bat SARS-like coronavirus are 100% identical based on the basic local alignment search tool. It follows that the bat virus has undergone genetic change, either artificial or natural, yet it is almost impossible for envelope protein to remain unaltered after natural mutation. So the only explanation left is artificial genetic modification. The lab was built precisely to look into the most dangerous pathogens like the novel coronavirus and conduct research on them. Towards the end of 2019, the mystery virus first popped up in Wuhan. Marketeer, virus search is going parabolic. But have a look at this tweet from Su Lin Wong. As anger in China grows over the initial cover-up of the Wuhan virus, here is an FT graphic showing a surge in keyword searches on Google blocked in China for Wuhan pneumonia in early January, which seems to indicate there was a premonition of some kind. The same spike didn't appear on Chinese search engine Baidu until Jan 20. In Wuhan, people are collapsing on streets due to the deadly virus, so helpless. China's National Microbiology Data Center releases first electron microscopic images of the novel coronavirus. The first, so look, we're in a very fluid situation. It is non-linear, it is exponential. Um, we are in a really interconnected world. The density of human beings and the density of human beings living cheek by jowl with animals. So I'm not opining on anything. All I'm saying is that these circumstances, you, you know, this is Bitcoin type stuff, right? You know, going back to when Bitcoin trained, traded less than a dollar, it can surge very, very quickly. Um, the first method for estimating the intelligence of a ruler is to look at the men he has around them. Niccolo Machiavelli. Philip Giraldi, who I picked up on recently and he wrote that very interesting article that, about the plane crash. A new definition of warfare sanctions can be more deadly than bullets, he says. Trump enhanced troop levels both in the Middle East and in Afghanistan while also increasing the frequency and lethality of armed drone attacks worldwide. Perhaps the definition of war itself should be expanded. Um, imposition of sanctions with lethal intent. Secretary Mike Pompeo has been explicit in his explanations that the assertion of extreme pressure on countries like Iran and Venezuela is intended to make the people suffer to such an extent that they rise up against their governments and bring about regime change. The sanctions can kill those imposed by the United States are backed up by the US Treasury, which is able to block cash transfers going through the dollar-denominated international banking system. Banks that do not comply with America's imposed rules can themselves be sanctioned, meaning that US sanctions are de facto globally applicable even if foreign banks and governments do not agree with the policies that drive them. In Venezuela, the effect of sanctions has been starvation as food imports have been blocked, forcing a large part of the population to flee the country just to survive. The latest exercise of United States economic warfare has been directed against Iraq. 
The decree was signed off on by Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi based on the fact that the US military was in Iraq at the invitation of the country's government and that invitation had just been revoked by Parliament. The persistence of US forces in the countries is ostensibly to aid in the fight against ISIS, but the real reason is to serve as a check on Iranian influence in Iraq. A State Department written response entitled The US Continued Partnership with Iraq asserted that American troops are in Iraq to serve as a force for good in the Middle East and that it is our right to maintain appropriate force posture in the region. The Iraqi position also immediately produced presidential threats and tweets about sanctions like they have never seen, with the implication that the US was more than willing to wreck the Iraqi economy if it did not get its way. The latest threat to emerge involves blocking Iraq access to its New York Federal Reserve bank account where international oil sale revenue is kept, creating a devastating cash crunch in Iraq's financial system that might indeed destroy the Iraqi economy. A US representative from the National Security Council named Richard Goldberg had visited London recently to make clear to the British government that if it does not follow the American lead and withdraw from the JCPOA and reapply sanctions, it might just be difficult to work out a trade agreement with Washington post-Brexit. Now the quid pro quo is clear. Britain, which normally does in fact follow the Washington lead in foreign policy, will now be expected to completely be on board all of the time and everywhere, particularly in the Middle East. During his visit, Goldberg told the BBC, the question for Prime Minister Johnson is, as you are moving towards Brexit, what are you going to do post 31st January as you come to Washington to negotiate a free trade agreement with the United States? It's absolutely in your interests and the people of Great Britain's interest to join with President Trump, with the United States, to realign your foreign policy away from Brussels and join the maximum pressure campaign to keep all of us safe. Wormser has recently submitted a series of memos to the White House advocating a policy of regime disruption with the Islamic Republic that will destabilize it and eventually lead to a change of government. He may have played a key role in giving the green light for the assassination of Soleimani. I've touched on this in several articles, 13th of January. Um, I, was say, I was quoting Nassim Taleb, there was perhaps no Soleimani threat, at least nothing new. And there was no need for it. Trump borrowed an old Persian trick, put the head of a horse in the enemy's bed. Um, I quoted Federico Piricini's article captioned the deeper story behind the assassination of Soleimani. Um, uh, um, Al-Mahdi had revealed details of his interactions with Trump. He tried to explain several times on live television how Washington had been browbeating him and other Iraqi members of parliament to tow the American line even threatening to engage in false flag sniper shootings of both protesters and security personnel in order to inflame the situation, recalling similar Modi operandi seen in Cairo in 2009, Libya in 2011 and the Maidan in 2014. That's why he visited China and signed an important agreement with them to undertake the infrastructure construction instead. And then he's responding and saying, Trump called me to ask me to reject the, this agreement. When I refused, he threatened to unleash huge demonstrations against me that would end my premiership. Huge demonstrations against me duly materialized. And Trump called again to threaten that if I did not comply with his demands, then he would have marine snipers on tall buildings target protesters and security personnel alike in order to pressure me. On top of that, as uh, um, Giraldi is saying, 
threatened to close the bank account at the Federal Reserve of New, uh, of New York. The US Fed basically has a stranglehold on the entire Iraqi economy. The assassination <clears throat> um, of Soleimani, Kronstein. Uh, are you sure this plan is full, foolproof? Kronstein, yes it is because I've anticipated every possible variation of counter move. Badra punchline, US plotting the return of strongman in Iraq. al Muhandis was the master craftsman who created the PMF under the direct watch of Soleimani. Iran will find it impossible to recreate the leadership these two titanic figures gave to the resistance front in Iraq. Will the PMF remain <clears throat> a powerful political faction or become prey to predatory forces in the uncertain times ahead. In the absence of an effective central command, contentious succession battles may even erupt between Iran-aligned groups within PMF and al sadr's bloc. In the chaotic situation that is developing in Iraq, it seems impossible for Iraqi politics to return to the status quo. This also seems to be the hidden U.S. agenda. There is growing risk that the meltdown of the Iraqi state can also lead to a replay of history. It was similar chaotic conditions that led to the Ramadan revolution in February 1963, the military coup by the Ba'ath Party's Iraqi wing, which was allegedly supported by the CIA. Trump will be undoubtedly pleased with such an outcome. 25th of November, I was talking about the alliance of Secretary Pompeo, the MAGA Tweet Army, Mariam Rajavi, MEK, and also now we've got to add in Reza Pahlavi. I also said Trump has been a big proponent of coercive financial currency and sanction warfare, and his policy of maximum pressure on Iran is that policy's apogee. To wit, Chigal tweeted, US blacklists foreign companies allegedly supporting Iran's petroleum sector. August 2018, Trump seems to be relishing his financial warfare strategies. I think around that time he tried to take out Maduro with a drone. Uh, September 2018, in an interview with Sputnik, I said the dollar is a weapon and Trump is relishing his financial warfare strategies. I said Trump's aggressive foreign policy is the signature success of this administration. It is highly effective. Trump can keep it up. It's working a treat. And so it begins, as this is an app, a boycott Amazon hashtag via Mark Owen Jones, and if you're interested in reading the report about um, the bugging of Jeff Bezos' phone, this is called Project Cato, that link is on Rich Wrap-Ups. I assume this was purely unintentional, still kind of funny on an international diplomatic incident, Prince Charles not recognising Vice President Pence, who I call the coming man in an article on the 4th of November at the moment of vision, the I see nothing. Um, Mr. Schiff, I must say, has been a phenomenal lawyer presenting a case, a compelling case, without none of the primary evidence. Let's move on to international markets. Uh, let's start with the euro dollar, 110.47. Dollar index, 97.71. Japanese yen, 109.63. Swiss franc, 0.9698. The pound, 131.38. It's been on a bit of a run of late. The Australian dollar, 0.6852. India rupee, 71.282. South Korean won, 1167.64. The Brazilian real, 4.1706. Egyptian pound, 15.7671. And the RAN, 14.36. This is a dollar index chart. As I said, I think the liquidity bomb is the defining issue and therefore I think it's capped. Euro dollar, as I said, 110, uh, oh, softening up again, 110.44. Commodity markets are suffering as concerns about global demand, add to weak Chinese import data, and virus contagion fears. This is from Daniel Lacalle, admittedly, 
after subsequently we had a little bit of a bounce. Copper, an important indicator of industrial growth, is now down on the year. This is WTI crude oil from the market ear, but a few hours old. We're currently at $55.72, having traded below 55 yesterday. Gold, 1558.40. I think, given the level of geopolitical uncertainty, it remains underpinned. Sub Saharan Africa, got to watch this. Boris Johnson. Um, and I, my French is not great, pose un acte diplomatique qui fera d'être écoutant bien Boris, Boris Johnson qui dit en anglais « Je suis désolé, je ne serre pas la main à ce monsieur, c'est un criminel. » But it's a short video where he blows off uh, uh, Cesar Nguesso. Isabel dos Santos, banker found dead in Lisbon. Nuno Ribeiro de Cunha managed the account of oil firm Sonangol, formerly chaired by Miss Dos Santos, the small Portuguese lender Euro Bic. He was found dead at one of his properties in Lisbon. A police source told Portuguese media that everything points to suicide. He was implicated in the embezzlement and money laundering case against Africa's richest woman. Uh, Rafael Marquez de Moraes has been reporting not only on Isabel Dos Santos's financial activities but the rest of the Dos Santos family via his news site Maca Angola for years. And this is the point that everybody knew what was going on. It's only now that it's popping over the radar. Libya, life as a client state looms, says, the, says Africa Confidential. As the U.S. leaves the scene, Russia and Turkey may be about to carve up the country between them. Whether General Khalifa Haftar will wait, will this year enter Tripoli in triumph, which he continually predicted for most of last year, is in doubt now that Libya's future is in the hands of foreign powers, especially Turkey and Russia. Um, and as I said on the 20th of January, Putin started on Haftar's side but likes to play a balancing role and might eventually align with Turkey. And I also said the main theatre for proxy operations is Libya. Ethiopia regime reality check the poster child for the new Africa. Abiy Ahmed faces tricky elections and more strident calls for local power sharing. His fresh-faced prosperity party are set for a tough struggle in elections despite domestic acclaim and enthusiastic international support, including the 2019 Nobel Peace Prize. The process leading up to the national vote already pushed tentatively to August from May, which was optimistic, is more likely to be violent and inconclusive than peaceful and clarifying. For Ethiopian Abbey, the West's latest darling in Africa, says Africa Confidential, 14th of October, on the occasion when he won the Nobel Prize, I, says, I said he faces a fiendishly complicated task, fending off the centripetal forces which are tearing Ethiopia apart. Um, again, Africa Confidential, Shishikedi cannot convert his multiple exhortations into action by the government without the FCC's consent, exactly as Kabila intended. And of course, in one interview last year, Kabila alluded to Arnold Schwarzenegger's famous quote, I'll be back. He never went. He's the puppet master. Briefing 150 from the crisis group averting proxy wars in the eastern DR Congo. What's new? Tensions are mounting in Africa's Great Lakes region among Burundi, Rwanda and Uganda, all of which allegedly back insurgents based in the eastern DRC. Kagame accuses Burundi and Uganda of backing Rwandan rebels active in the DR Congo, north and south Kivu provinces and threatens to retaliate for those groups' attacks on his country. In turn, Burundi and Uganda assert that Rwanda supports Burundian and Ugandan rebels in the DRC. At the same time, DRC's new president, Felix Shishikedi, has floated plans to invite Burundi, Rwanda and Uganda 
to conduct joint military operations with DRC troops against insurgents sheltering in his country, a risky policy that could fuel proxy conflicts. Um, so, he, so basically Rwanda and its two neighbours, uh, tensions have escalated. Kagame openly threatened to retaliate against his neighbours after an October 2019 raid in Rwanda by a North Kivu-based militia that he alleges is supported by Burundi and Uganda. For its part, Burundi claims Rwanda backs Burundian rebels based in South Kivu that it asserts are behind recent attacks in Burundi. Uh, speaking at a swearing-in ceremony for ministers and military officials and visibly agitated, Kagame addressed Rwandan members of parliament, both English and in his native Kenya Rwanda. The country has been stably said since his military takeover ended the 1994 genocide, but its security is once again in peril, this time from outside its borders. Did not name those at fault, but his message was clear. Rwanda's neighbours were undermining the country's security and he was prepared to retaliate if need be. The noise is being made from neighbouring countries. There is not much that I can do about it, he said, but anything crossing our border and coming here to destabilise us, we have proven that we can deal with it. We will put you back where you belong. There is no question about it. Kagame's speech came shortly after an attack on Rwanda launched from the eastern DRC. It killed 14 people in Kingingi village, a hub for mountain guerrilla tourism in Rwanda's Mozanzi district. Um, and then uh, assailants came from Burundi, launched an attack in the Nyungwe forest in southwestern Rwanda, another tourist attraction. Um, UN group of experts, which reports the Security Council, concluded that the P5 a group of Rwandan opposition factions, including the RNC, were working with the rebels in the DRC with the aim of toppling Kagame's government. Um, Burundi is ahead of elections scheduled for May 2020. Kurenzinza increasingly depends on the Ibonora Cure to repress political opponents. Um, it's a competition between Rwanda and Uganda, traditionally has played out mostly in the DRC. Uh, you remember when they fought for control of the city of Kisangani in 2000 and they backed different rebellions in the DRC over the past 12 years. It's a very good in-depth article giving uh, a lot of insights. Shishikedi's push for the three neighbours to send troops to root out rebels from the DRC is a high-stakes gambit. Um, real risk that growing tension will fuel a wider regional security crisis where Burundian, Rwandan and Ugandan forces given a green light for operation the DRC, the danger would be all the graver, raising the spectre of an interlocking proxy war wherein each Great Lakes country is backing its rivals' enemies. South African all shares up 0.335%, dollar rand at 14.36545. Egyptian pound continuing on its way, 15.77383. EGX30 down 1.67% year to date. Nigerian all share up 9.75% year to date. Best performing um, uh, stock market, I think, in the world. Ghana Stock Exchange up 0.9% year to date. Total and Tello launch joint sale of stakes in Kenyan oil project. This is Reuters. Tallo willing to sell its entire 50% stake. Total aims to reduce stake from 25% to 15%. Project launch faces delay. Uh, this is blocks 10BA, 10BB and 13T in the South Lokichar Basin. Uh, entire project is valued at between $1.25 to $2 billion, but it's hard to be precise because the development is yet to receive a final investment decision, two of the sources said. Um, fields already produce about 2,000 barrels of oil per day as part of an early production system. Um, project partners have also agreed with the Kenyan government to develop a crude oil pipeline from Lokichar to Lamu. But you know, Lamu is under significant asymmetric warfare pressure. According to Ramanyang, Kenya's big four is a big mirage, he said yesterday. 
World Bank's chief economist said it may be better to slow down, perhaps cut back on borrowing and financing big projects, take more of a long-term perspective and make sure that the way these projects are financed is truly sustainable. Cumulative remittance inflows in the full year 2019 clocked $2.796 billion, up 3.7% from 2018. Our human capital is clearly the most valuable capital of all. Nairobi all shares minus 0.53% and the NSE 20s minus 0.46%. I wish you a great weekend.